But you know, so God says to him, you're concerned about the bush for which you did not labor and which you did not grow. It came into being in a night and perished in a night. And should I not be concerned about Nineveh, that great city in which there are more than 120,000 people who do, do not know their right hand from their left, and also many animals. I've always been intrigued by that. That's the last line in the book of Jonah, and also many animals. I guess because the animals were made to repent too, even though they had no concept of what they were repenting of. But, you know, people who don't know their right hand from their left. These people did understand that they had done wrong, and so they repent. And we also have to remember that Jonah, the book of Jonah, according to the vast majority of scripture scholars, is a made-up story but at a time when the Jews are under persecution and it's a reminder to them that God is faithful and that God does indeed love them and that even though they can have antipathy towards their enemies, God will take care of things in the end. He will take care of them. He will right whatever wrongs need to be taken care of and uh, the enemies will be taken care of as they need to be taken care of. But then, you know, so from the aspect of mercy, God takes mercy on the Ninevites when he sees that they are sincere in their repentance. Uh, <clears throat> and then in Ezekiel here, God does not want a sinner to die but to be converted so say to them, as I live, says the Lord God, I have no pleasure in the death of the wicked, but that the wicked turn from their ways and live. Turn back, turn back from your evil ways, for why will you die, O house of Israel? You know, St. Paul repeats it, you know, that God does not will the death of the sinner, but rather that the sinner should repent. Uh, and return to the Lord. Uh, so, anyway, <clears throat> any questions or anything on this so far? <coughs> Excuse me. I sound worse than I feel. <coughs> okay. So number three then, what should we ask for and how do we pray? The parable of the unjust judge and the widow concludes with the judge's promise to do justice for the widow because of her persistence. And then the clincher here, persistent prayer is also capable of changing God's heart. But then we come to where the rubber meets the road for many, many people. Nevertheless, People often experience unanswered prayer and feel as though their prayers were never even heard. Where are God's compassion and mercy when the cries of his elect who are the neediest, ranging from the widow to the orphan and finally to poor and sick children, do not seem to be heard? And if they are heard, why do the results seem to demonstrate that the requests were not granted? You know, sometimes we can glibly try to tell people, I know I've done this. Uh, well, God can also say no to something that you ask. Now, if somebody's in pain uh, because they really, you know, they lost someone or that some terrible thing has happened, after they've prayed mightily that it not be so, and I just say, well, God said no. Well, it would be pretty insensitive on my part to just kind of say it that way uh, because it's not empathizing with, with them who have gone through this experience now. 
of, of loss, pain, whatever it might be. So, um, how do we deal with that? So, <coughs> the suggestion is to look at, the, look at another parable about the persistent friend. And he said to them, suppose one of you has a friend and you go to him at midnight and say to him, friend, lend me three loaves of bread for a, fr uh, for a friend of mine has arrived and I have nothing to set before him. And he answers from within, do not bother me. The door has already been locked and my children are with me in bed. I cannot get up to and give you anything. Now you have to remember that we're not talking about, you know, a, 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 a bi-level house with a number of bedrooms and things. We're talking about a room, which was bedroom, living room, kitchen, bathroom, uh, you know, such as it was, uh, a conference hall, uh, you know, detention center, and, and everything else. Uh, so there was one bed usually too, and everybody was in it. So you know yourself if you've ever been in a very tight situation where you have a lot of people sleeping in one place, or maybe you've had the experience of a number of people sleeping in one big bed, and the person in the middle of the pile has to get up to go to the bathroom. Well. You may not have to go, but you're all awake anyway because this guy has to get out and go and do his thing. Uh, so, uh, you know, this it, it is a bother. And so here's, and so this guy doesn't want to get up and have to crawl over and wake everybody up in order to go to the door and take care of his friend. And so just Jesus says, I tell you, even though he will not get up and give him anything because he is his friend, at least because of his persistence, he will get up and give him whatever he needs. In other words, I'm going to give him what he needs so he'll go away, leave me alone. Maybe we'll get some sleep tonight before, you know, before it's time to get up and go do whatever. And that's when Jesus says, So I say to you, ask and it will be given to you. Search and you will find. Knock and the door will be opened for you. For everyone who asks receives. Everyone who searches finds. And for everyone who knocks, the door will be opened. Is there anyone among you, if your child asks for a fish, will give a snake instead of a fish? Or if a child asks for an egg, will give a scorpion? Now, remember that there was a species of scorpion in the Holy Land that put itself in the shape of an egg. You know, so that if you weren't paying attention, said, oh, look, here's this egg is laying here. I think I'll take it. You pick it up, well, then you have a handful of scorpion uh, who would probably not be too happy and try to sting you. Uh, which then could be the last mistake you would ever make. So if you then, who are evil, know how to give good gifts to your children, how much more will the Heavenly Father give the Holy Spirit to those who ask Him? Okay? So, Jesus again, and this is another one out of Luke's Gospel, where he's trying to teach people the importance of prayer and of persevering in prayer. Uh, so Jesus exhorts people to ask, seek, and knock because God is capable of giving, finding, and opening. He then says, and this is where the Holy Spirit starts to come in, you know, via what Joel had said earlier. <coughs> he then says that if a father is capable of giving his son a fish instead of a serpent and an egg instead of a scorpion, how much more willing God is to give the Holy Spirit to those who ask him? And it seems like this is from left field at this point. Because at first glance, it does not seem that the Holy Spirit 
is an issue here in the least. However, and these, this emphasis is mine, he is the principal gift to ask for in prayer because only from the Spirit, only, only the Spirit allows us to distinguish a fish from a serpent and an egg from a scorpion. Now, I think most of us could figure out the difference between a, between a fish and a snake. So it's not that, you know, we have no capability of doing that, but it's, it's the reminder that in certain circumstances that to come to know what the right thing to do is, the good thing to give, it requires the enlightenment of, of the Holy <coughs> Spirit. So, many times people pray for what seems useful and necessary to them, but it may not seem so to God because what they ask for is secondary and does not enter into His will. So, all those people who pray when the lottery gets up to, you know, close to a billion dollars like it did not so long ago, Powerball at least, or, um, you know, start praying for, you know, winning the lottery, uh, you know, becoming rich. Uh, I, I, I'm sorry to obsess about money, but it seems to be the main thing that people, you know, want. Uh, not quite what the world needs now is love, sweet love. What the world needs now is a little more money. Uh, but um, God ultimately knows what is best for us. But that should never dissuade us from praying. Now remember, this is all about mercy. So... <clears throat> God's will, merciful will, is to see us fully alive and without any encumbrances to that full living. Our problem is that because we are who we are, we sin, we fall short, we make bad choices. And so we are not always choosing those things that, that give life. We don't always ask God for the best thing. So that's why we move into that uh, verse 26 there from Romans chapter 8. Likewise, the Spirit helps us in our weakness, for we do not know how to pray as we ought. But that very Spirit intercedes with sighs too deep for words, and God who searches the heart knows what is in the mind of the Spirit because the Spirit intercedes for the saints according to the will of God. Now, a number of years ago, my, my then spiritual director told me to get a hold of this one book uh, written, well, it was written by somebody of the conferences between Saint Seraphim of Sarov and this gentleman who was known as Molitov. And one of the things that Saint Seraphim constantly says is that we pray for the acquisition of the Holy Spirit. And until today, I've wondered about that. But then going through this, I said, oh, that's what he meant. That rather than praying for this particular thing, that what I need to do is ask for the Holy Spirit, always praying for the Holy Spirit, so that the Spirit can do the Spirit's work in my life can do the discerning that needs to be done 
can do the choosing that needs to be done so that then I'm enlightened and guided by the, the Holy Spirit, the third person of the Trinity, rather than thinking that I'm hanging out here on my own someplace. So that's why I put in brackets there. Now I understand why. So the invitation to persevere in prayer is given to all. So it's not just for special people that we are all given this grace to persevere in our prayer. The thing is, many of us are people who are used to instant gratification. You know, when we walk in the house, (coughs) pick up a remote and click it, and whatever it is, whatever apparatus it's supposed to offer or... You know, we do it with our phones or however we do it. You know, I'm probably the least savvy about any of that stuff, so I still have a remote. I don't turn the lights on in my house with my phone, for example, or or any of those things. But um, we are used to instant gratification. You know, we don't want to wait. So... If it, if it takes our, you know, if we have a desktop computer, <coughs> how, you know, how 20th century, um, or, you know, a laptop or something that just seems to take, in, you know, interminable amount of time, a minute or two to, you know, come up and be online, uh, it just seems like an eternity. Or, you know, people who are so taken up with Facebook, et cetera, et cetera, uh, who, are, who have to get to it all the time. It's because, you know, they got to know the latest thing. Somebody has this, you know, or Twitter or, for, or whatever else. I just got to know what he thinks. Why? Because I have to. Or I want everybody to know what I think about this. Because after all, I'm the most important person on the face of the earth. And I just want you to finally acknowledge that. You know, but, it, but it's, the, again, it's, I got to have everything right away. You know, we have to have everything instant. Uh, you know, it's all, everything in our culture is about fast, fast, fast. Uh, and we get used to it and we have an expectation. Americans are notorious for this. Mm -hmm. So if we went to Ghana and had to stand in a line in immigration, you know, to have our passports checked, and it took longer than five minutes, we'd probably be ready to start a revolution. And having lived in Colombia 30 plus years ago, where they just used to relish having a gringo having to wait in line or being passed over to take care of Colombians as their way of getting revenge for everything that the United States has ever done to anybody else in the world, but especially like to make Americans stew because, after all, you people think you run the universe and guess what? Now you're playing on our field, and we set the rules here. Because I was told the first time I had to go to a government office, just be prepared to wait a long time. Be patient. And don't show your annoyance, or it'll take even longer. Either that or they'll expect you to hand them a bribe and then, you know, they'll grease the wheels. So, anyway, but it's because we want everything right away that we don't want to persevere in asking and seeking and knocking. Uh, When it's a severe case, of course, if someone is, is gravely ill and we're praying like mad for their healing, um or at least their deliverance from so much suffering, that's understandable. But sometimes when we want, to, we want something so bad that, you know, but we can't understand why God can't see it my way. 
Why can't you give me this thing now? Um, and so often it's driven because that's just the way we are. We want it. We want it now. Give it to me now. Uh, so anyway, the invitation to persevere in prayer is given to all. So persevering in faith. We think faith is identified with a group of concepts, so it is the same for everybody, or conversely, that it corresponds to what is incomprehensible. So, faith, I've often def defined faith in distinction to belief. And, you know, it may be a distinction without a difference, or a difference without a distinction. Um, but faith, I, I put at the level of emotional engagement, meaning that it's what I believe about God or the concepts that I have that I give my heart to, that I ascend, assent to, and so that it engages me, that I'm, I'm totally in it. It's not just my head in agreement with, with these propositions or concepts. It's that I've, you know, I'm all in in every way that I can be in faith. Uh, so faith is actually difficult to hold on to, especially when, when people ask for something that's not granted. They then desist in prayer and end up with a lack of faith. And you may meet people, or you may have ex had this experience yourself, where maybe you walked away from the church, from prayer, from God for a while, because you got tired of asking, seeking, knocking, and never getting what you were asking for. And feeling like you, you've, been, you've been had. And there are those people who, because... You know, maybe at some point in their life, they were used to, to things coming all the time. You know, they were always getting answers to their prayers. They pray for a parking space in downtown Chicago, and zingo, there it is. Or they pray that they pass this exam, and not only did they pass the exam, but they got a relatively high mark. Uh, they probably did study, too, but that's beside the point. But, you know, they're so used to this kind of stuff and the more the mundane things that they would be asking God for, and then something real big comes up and they don't get it, and they can't understand why. Well, why won't she love me? Why won't he accept me? Why won't they do what I think they ought to do in our, here in our company? After all, Lord, I prayed. I have faith in you. You know, you know my, my motive here is, is pure or whatever. Why aren't you giving it to me? Or, you know, and I, I always default to this example, and if you've heard it enough times, I apologize. But back in 1998, my 37-year-old sister-in-law was diagnosed, with, well, 97, was diagnosed with ovarian cancer. She was diagnosed in September and was dead by the following February, leaving my brother with three young children to raise. Everybody and their cousin was praying for her healing. Didn't happen. My father, who had been very lukewarm about any practice of faith for a long time, went through a long period where he was regularly going to church and all of that. And then after my sister-in-law died, he sort of reverted to the, to the previous behavior because he couldn't understand why somebody like my sister-in-law, Tricia, shouldn't have been healed where, you know, you get all these other people, you know, I can almost hear my dad saying this, but I'll spare you the direct in, in, in uh, imitation. Uh, 
all of these hypocrites who, uh, you know, go to church on Sunday and then couldn't care less about anybody from, from uh, Sunday afternoon through the next Sunday morning uh, and living their lives like they were, you know, somewhere else. Uh, you know, when you encounter things like that, you see people who don't really seem to mean what they say, uh, that can shake one's faith. My father started out by telling me once upon a time that he was, you know, he's pretty good with faith until during the Second World War when they were going into Germany, um, you know, so this is 1945, and they come in through Charlemagne's town there, Aachen in Germany, and on the way into Aachen, you have, you know, there are all these roads and at every crossroads or whatever, there's a roadside crucifix, you know, with a little roof over it, because um, it's, you know, per Catholic part of the country. And, um, and, you know, all kinds of churches. And then, you know, my dad said he remembers that, you know, when they got into a place and it was secure, you know, the chaplain, you know, the priest chaplain, decides he's going to have a mass and everybody's, you know, invited to come that wants to come. So my dad is there and he said, you know, I bet, that, I bet not too far away from here there's a bunch of Germans in church who wish that, you know, that this place would fall in and kill us all. You know, we've just spent all this time killing all their people and they probably don't have a very warm feeling towards us. <laughs> 